Good evening and thank you for watching ECSO News on Blab TV where facts matter. I'm Amber Southerd. Several illegal narcotics are now off the streets after Escambia County deputies pull over a man for a traffic violation. On May 13th, Robert Darnell Alexander Steens was pulled over for a traffic violation on Layette Drive. During a search of Alexander Steens' vehicle, methamphetamines, crack cocaine, powder cocaine, ecstasy pills, bottles of promethrazine, and marijuana were discovered. Alexander Steens was arrested and charged with several different narcotics violations and driving without a license. Two Escambia County men are behind bars after using a stolen ATV to commit more crimes. On May 15th, around 4 a.m., an ECSO deputy stopped the suspects in the 6,000 block of Spanish Oak Court. During the investigation, it was discovered they were using an ATV that had been stolen earlier in the month. During a search of the suspects, vehicle keys were discovered, tying them to a May 14th vehicle burglary and ATV theft in the same neighborhood. The undamaged ATV was located in a nearby wooded area and returned to the owner. Timothy Eugene Scarborough and Robert Wayne Lamar were both arrested and charged with burglary of an unoccupied conveyance, grand theft of a motor vehicle, and petty theft. And on April 13th, ECSO deputies responded to a burglary at Dave Howe Tires. Once on scene, investigators discovered the fence behind the business had been cut and $12,000 worth of tires stolen. ECSO investigators received tips about Johnny Antoine Lee selling tires with distinctive markings, like the ones stolen from Dave Howe Tires. An undercover investigator contacted Lee and arranged to purchase the tires. The undercover investigator met Lee at his home in the 500 block of Irene Lane in Cantonment. Once at the home, the investigators found some of the stolen tires and arrested Lee. The investigation is ongoing. Anyone with any information about this incident can call the ECSO at 436-9620 or Crime Stoppers at 433-STOP. And do you recognize this woman? Ternisha Lorraine Cook is last week's winner in our Wheel of Fugitives. If you see her, let us know by calling Crime Stoppers at 433-STOP. Ternisha will receive a stay in our Gold Star Hotel and you'll collect a cash reward. Well, the glamorous Deputy Peterson's here with us with Damn. Crime Stoppers. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so who do we have today that we're, we're looking for? Our three one of fugitives this week is uh, Kit Kirkpatrick. Mm -hmm. She's 38 years of age. She's wanted for possession of cocaine and destroying evidence with a bond of $5,500. Um, our next one of fugitive is uh, Shannon McGee. Shannon's one of her grand theft of a motor vehicle, and she's 32 years of age. Her bond is $3,500. And finally, we have uh, Peter Herbert, Jr., who's 22, and he's wanted for grand theft and dealing in stolen property with a bond of $6,000. So, well, if you recognize any of them, we would love for you to call Crime Stoppers at 433 STOP. But you know, I was out last week uh, around the county and I kind of noticed there's nowhere really you can go now without seeing one of those kiosks and their face on it. No, and we're so <laughs> thankful. We just added three in the Walgreens. We've got them at three locations Brenton, Michigan, Mobile and Softly, Mobile and Fairfield. Mm -hmm. And we've got one going in the Walmart on Mobile Highway mm -hmm. starting next week. So I'm excited. Wonderful. And I was in traffic the other day, and a bus pulled up next to me. Yes. Saw the Crime Stoppers advertising there. Hey, people, crime doesn't pay, but we do. And I want everybody to know it. And we're putting it everywhere we can in the county. Yeah. And especially match with the Sheriff's uh, Morgan support mm -hmm. of those kiosks. Um, you know, we're, we're tackling crime all over the place. Good deal. Well, you've kind of switched programs. I know we've talked about it a few times, but we want to oh. make sure people are familiar with it. How can people report? Absolutely. Well, three ways, of course. Four, three. 3STOP is the most common that goes directly to our call center but they can go to p3tips.com now and that's also available in a mobile app or they can go to uh, gulfcoastcrimestoppers.org and I always tell everybody just visit our, our uh, Facebook page as well all yeah. that information is right there but it's I'm really excited we are literally everywhere mixed with the digital billboards I mean yeah. you know the, these fugitives can't hide for long. There's nowhere to hide. <laughs> no here. way. Well, thank you so much for joining us, and I'll see you for Will of thank Fugitives. You. And again, if you uh, recognize anybody in tonight's episode or anybody on the kiosk, please call 433 STOP.
This week is your last chance to vote in our bullying prevention contest. The elementary age students worked hard on their artwork, so make sure you visit our Instagram page to vote. Voting ends this Monday, May 22nd. Last week on ECSO News, we said goodbye to a few of our canines to retirement. This week, we are welcoming a few new canines to the team. Welcome canine Luke and canine Odie. We know you both will be valuable members of the ECSO. If you want to see more pictures or information about our new canines, visit our Facebook page at facebook.com slash official ECSO. We need your help locating the people in this week's Missing Persons segment. The first juvenile we are highlighting in this segment is 17-year-old Trayton Dion Johnson. Johnson is a habitual runaway. He has been missing since May 4, 2017. We're also looking for 15-year-old Tavon Dwayne Morris. He's been missing since April 16th. Morris is also wanted for an active warrant. Additionally, we're looking for 17-year-old Devin Jackson. He is an habitual runaway and believed to be in Pensacola living with unknown friends. Jackson has been missing since February 23, 2017. If you have any information on these missing people, contact the ECSO at 436-9620. Last week, we honored our fallen officers during an annual memorial ceremony. Many family members of our fallen officers attended the emotional event. Next week, we plan to show the ceremony right here on ECSO News, Tuesday night at 8 o'clock. Make sure to watch. Well, it's May, so it's Bike Safety Week, and who better to talk to than Sergeant Brown here? He is part of our bicycle, what would you call it? The, the unit. It's a bike unit, bike, bike patrol unit. unit. Okay. Yes, All right. So, can you tell us a little bit about the bike unit? How many members are on it, and what it takes to qualify? Well, currently, uh, we probably have a, at least 50 to 60 mm -hmm. certified uh, bike riders here at the sheriff's office. Mm -hmm. um, recently, last year, I went through IPIMBA, which is the International Police Mountain Bike Association's instructor course, and now I can certify our, our deputies uh, through IPIMBA as uh, certified bike riders. I saw some of the video of that last year. That is that's difficult. You guys are going down stairs and and everything else. It's it's very very difficult. And and for some of our new riders, when they come in, they want to be part of the bike unit, but they haven't rode bikes in ten years. Mm -hmm. uh, me and fortunately, I've stayed on a bike throughout my career and you know from my youth. Um, so we now teach a forty hour class instead of twenty four hours. So it gives them a couple extra days to practice and, and complete the course successfully. And as a deputy on the bike patrol unit, what are some of the responsibilities that you have each day? Well, it's, it's basically patrol, um, it, unless there's a specialized event like Blue Angels, mm -hmm. something like that. Or, uh, but the, the biggest thing about the bike unit is it takes that wall, that barrier down mm -hmm. from being in a car. Uh, we can hear more, we see more, and we contact people more, and they're more likely to come up and speak to us because that wall is just not there. Uh, it, you know, the, the cruiser is a good response vehicle, but for everyday community policing, the bike is awesome. So like big events and things like that, like you were saying, the Blue Angels, being out there, it's, it's easier to navigate through crowds? Absolutely. You can't get around on a car. Anybody has been to Pensacola Beach during Blue Angels, you can't drive anywhere out there. Mm -hmm. uh, the bike response time is literally seconds versus, you know, minutes going somewhere in a vehicle. And we have plenty of races each weekend here in Pensacola, and especially as the weather gets nicer, um, that's something that you all are a part of as well. Absolutely. We'll be out there Saturday morning for the triathlon. It's a half triathlon on Pensacola Beach. So we'll participate and we'll do uh, traffic control for the bike riders and the runners when they're on that portion of the course. So we'll, we'll be out there. What are um, some safety tips you can give people that might be riding bicycles that, you know, everybody says it's, it's like riding a bike, but like you said, sometimes <laughs> it's been 10 years it's, and you get on and you might need those training wheels. It's very difficult. <laughs> yeah. uh, I guess the, the most obvious is, uh, you know, the bike helmet. Uh, I know for some people it looks silly to put that helmet on, especially if you haven't worn one in a, in a, a long, long time. Uh, but why would you not wear one? It's, it's mm -hmm. like saying that I'm not going to wear my vest today. It's, it's part right. of your protective equipment. Um, that's the first and most important part of riding a bike. And the biggest thing is not to confuse a bike helmet for like a skater's helmet or something mm -hmm. like that. They're, they're very different, distinct, they have uh, different purposes. Uh, a bike helmet is basically designed to sustain a major impact one time mm -hmm. versus a skater's helmet that's designed to sustain minor impacts over a period of time. Mm -hmm. Usually one fall for a bike helmet, you, it's time to replace it. Right. Um, we don't require you to wear, in the state of Florida, to wear eye protection, but I mm -hmm. encourage it. 
uh, especially for your children in their learning to ride. Give them mm -hmm. something, you know, to put over their eyes, protect their eyes, yeah. keep the dust out of their eyes. If they can't see, they can't ride type thing. Right. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, is there, uh, speaking of things that are that are legal, riding a bicycle, is there anything that the state of Florida requires you to have? If you choose to operate your, mo uh, your motorcycle, your bicycle on the roadway, you have to operate it on the roadway as a vehicle. You're, you're required to obey every traffic law that a vehicle would. Uh, I know you don't, you can't travel 50 miles an hour. Some of them may, but um, you're required to stop at stop signs, red lights. Uh, you're, you're required to signal. You're required to change lanes properly when you're allowed to do so, just as if you were in a vehicle. Mm -hmm. If you choose to operate your bicycle on the sidewalk, you have to yield to the pedestrian foot traffic. They have the right of way on the sidewalk. That's really and if there was um, any resources for people to go to, um, is there some place on our website or a number that they could call if they have any questions? Not or? currently, but if, if they need to, they're more than welcome to contact me through the Sheriff's Office mm -hmm. and I'll be happy to help them or point them in the right direction. Uh, a lot of the local bike shops here would probably have uh, a lot better resources and uh, outreach and, and might even have some uh, old equipment or safety equipment that they're not using that they'd be willing to donate. I, I don't know that for sure, but I'd be happy to point them in the right direction if they contact me. Great. And you're out riding on the beach now? That's I am. Can find I am. Yes, ma'am. So if you see me out there, uh, you'll see my white legs shining. Uh, I'll be in shorts, but uh, uh, I enjoy riding out there. It's fun. Yeah. It's, it's, everything's right there in a, in a close area. Uh, but I enjoy riding in town a lot, too. We were able, especially at night on bikes, we're able to sneak up. And you'd be surprised of how much, you know, how many guns and drugs and arrests that we make on bike patrol. Because wow. people don't see us coming, and that's mm -hmm. the, one of the biggest things is stealth. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, it takes down that wall, and we can hear things that you wouldn't hear in, in, in a vehicle. Hey, I've got a question. Um, I know when I travel to other places, I see people that have to ride on the side of the road, not on the sidewalk, but on the side of the road in their bikes because that's law. Here, is, is that the, the case, or can they ride on the sidewalk? You, or you can ride on the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. Again, if, if you choose to ride on the sidewalk, you have to yield the right of way to foot traffic, pedestrian foot okay. traffic. Uh, some of the areas like uh, Davis Highway, they have the bike lanes mm -hmm. just because it's such a busy uh, area. If you choose to operate on a road where there's not a bike lane, you have to operate in the furthest most right lane mm -hmm. in the direction that you're going. And you're allowed that three feet um, mm -hmm. area from the roadway, from the edge of the road out, unless you're op overtaking another vehicle, you have an obstruction like a, a gutter or you know debris in the road, then you can come out further. So it's just as much responsibility as, as the bike rider it is for the motor vehicle traffic to look out for each other. These are great tips. Well, thank you so much for joining yes, us. We appreciate it. And again, if you have any more questions, you can always call 436-9630 and ask to speak to Sergeant Brown. I'm here with Senior Deputy Terry Hammock, and we're here to talk about motorcycle safety. Um, he's part of the traffic unit. Can you yes. tell us a little bit about our traffic unit? Yes, ma'am, absolutely. Um, there are seven members of the traffic unit um, that are here with the Scambia County Sheriff's Office. We are a unit that patrols, do answer calls. Uh, main focus is traffic enforcement. Um, we have vehicles, cars that we drive in, and also motorcycles that we drive um, every day. Um, our main functions are funeral escorts and any type of big events that require any type of escorting through, through this county. And um, how long have you been a part of the traffic unit here? Um, I've been with the traffic unit for approximately two and a half years. And what kind of, I'm sure there's some extra training that is required to be a part of the traffic unit and yes. to operate a motorcycle. Absolutely. Can you talk about that? Yes, ma'am. Um, you have to have a minimum of the uh, Florida um, endorsement class to get on your driver's license, to have it on your driver's license. Um, additional to that, there's a 40-hour class in-house class that you have to go to to actually pass it and to be authorized to drive it through the sheriff's office. And um, does everyone have kind of a different responsibility each day or how does that work? Does it just, you know, it's different every day? Yes, it, yes it is. Um, our main focus each day is the funeral escorts that we provide through, um, throughout the county. Um, other than that, then we kind of have other obligations such as traffic complaints, whether it be parking complaints or speeders through neighborhoods and things like that that we respond to. And talk about the differences between operating a patrol vehicle as a deputy as opposed to a motorcycle. 
Right. Well, a patrol car is working as a sheriff's office is much safer. Obviously, you have the entire car for safety. Um, you, I don't want to say you don't have to be quite as aware, but um, on a motorcycle, there's nothing to protect you there. So you as a rider have to be uh, very aware of everything that's going on around you at all times. You can't, um, you know, wonder and you have to be focused at all time while you're riding a motorcycle. Right. And, um, you know, you all are often advocates of, you know, sending out the message to other motorcyclists um, about the safety of their vehicles and how to operate their vehicles and um, some good information for them and tips. Can you provide some of that here, too? Absolutely. Um, as a motorcycle operator, you know, it is important that you check your motorcycles every day before you ride them. I mean, I know it may seem redundant, but you have to check your air pressure, you have to check your brakes, you have to check everything on it because when you're operating and something goes on, it's more than likely going to be a serious and or fatal crash. And I'm sure you all deal with some serious crashes Absolutely. Yes, throughout ma the year. Yes, ma'am. We do, unfortunately. And again, you know, with all the training that you have and all the awareness that you have when you're driving a motorcycle, um, it's a high possibility that you will be involved in some type of crash while operating a motor vehicle or a motorcycle on a public roadway. What is there like a number one kind of mistake that you see motorcyclists make or what are some of the top things? Yes, yeah, some a few of the top things are um, speed, first of all. Um, that, that's probably the number one thing is going too fast, driving for conditions, uh, whether that be negotiating a curve or road hazards or um, the other thing is just uh, driving outside your capabilities. If you are a professional rider, you may be a little bit better rider than the novelist who's just starting. And a lot of times people try to keep up with someone who rides better than them, which causes an accident. And oftentimes uh, motorcyclists ride in groups. Are there any safety tips when it comes to that? Yes, absolutely. If you're riding a motorcycle single, it's a very small print. So if a vehicle looks and can't see you because you're a single motorcycle and you're so small and generally they're used to seeing big trucks, cars, SUVs and things of that nature. Um, if you ride in a group of motorcycles obviously you're a bigger print whenever people look down um, and you should always ride like in a staggered formation which um, is one bike and then the other bike on this side, which gives the ability that if something happens, you can swerve over or stop without hitting your partner who's riding next to you in the lane with you. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us, yes, Senior Deputy Terry Hammock. I'm Escambia County Sheriff David Morgan, and thank you for watching Ask the Sheriff. This is your chance to ask me any questions you want answered about the ECSO. Our team hits the streets again, and here are some of the questions you asked. Ellen uh, is uh, a little bit of a frustrated uh, you know, parent or guardian, and I understand that. And the reason why is her question is that Camp Friendship this year, uh, obviously when she found out about it or made application, it had already filled up and could we hold another one and that she will actually volunteer. Uh, Ellen, unfortunately, it's not just the sheriff's office. And, and again, we, uh, you know, I sincerely apologize for you not getting into one. Uh, as you can well imagine, even though our officers from the, primarily from the school resource officer program, volunteer during the summers to conduct these programs, they're still sheriff's office employees and we are paying them, you know, to be there. They just volunteer instead of, you know, taking a little bit of time off and being with their families or going to the Florida Sheriff's Youth Ranch. Uh, we have folks that volunteer to go up there and fill in, uh, you know, every year. It's, it goes beyond the sheriff's office. It's also our school system. Uh, Superintendent Thomas uh, and his folks, uh, you know, volunteer the school resources for us, meaning the venues where we actually meet. And so the utility bills and the cleanup, et cetera, is a cost that's also borne you know, by our school system. So while we talk about it's a volunteer effort, which it largely uh, you know, is from a, from a personnel perspective, uh, there is cost associated with that. And also there's a time frame. You know, how many of these can we conduct each year? 
uh, in the time that we have. And so, again, I'm, I'm sincerely sorry that you did not get to, into this year's Camp Friendship, uh, but I would ask again that you stay in contact with us and, and again, make application, you know, when we hold another one. Uh, but, you know, we are constrained by so many things in the number of those that we can uh, hold annually. Uh, the question is, is there a juvenile curfew? Uh, the short answer is no uh, in Escambia County. There are exceptions to that, though, as there is <laughs> with most things in life, unfortunately. Uh, if a juvenile has been adjudicated, uh, meaning they've gone through the, the uh, Department of Juvenile Justice system, uh, it's almost always uh, a condition of their release back to their families, their guardians, etc., uh, that they have a curfew, meaning they must be home by a certain hour. Now, there are exceptions to that uh, if they are currently employed uh, and they're, you know, they can go to and from work and, and breach that curfew. Uh, but a general curfew overall in Escambia County for juveniles, no, we currently do not have one. Some communities do. Uh, some communities believe that that's uh, uh, you know, a further tool, if you will, for law enforcement uh, to control you know, certain juvenile crimes and, and criminal activity. Uh, that's been both proven and disproven uh, throughout the, our nation and, and all the different communities. Uh, it can be uh, very effective in some instances and ineffective in others. Uh, as you can well imagine, if we did juvenile sweeps every night, uh, you're going to load up the uh, Department of Juvenile Justice system. Uh, where do you retain and or incarcerate these juveniles once they're uh, uh, taken into custody? You have to find a responsible adult, meaning a parent. Uh, or a guardian that you can release them to if there's a civil citation involved in this, uh, you know, first contact with, uh, you know, their behaviors. So, uh, as with all things, while up front, boy, that's a great idea, let's have a curfew. Uh, that's a great idea if you're a normal person. And by that I mean uh, you're a responsible, engaged uh, adult and parent. And when you find out there's a curfew, you sit your children down and you say, uh, you know, okay, oh, Bobby, Susie, you are going to be home. Uh, before 10 o'clock every night because we have a new ordinance, county ordinance, that says that, you know, juveniles below the age of must be home with the exception of if you're going to or from your job. That's a great idea, isn't it? And again, for most families that would probably work. Uh, however, we don't deal with the average families in law enforcement. You know, we don't uh, walk through your neighborhood and knock on doors and congratulate you on what a great job you're doing and, and check to see that your children at home. Let me give you just a prime example. We're working with the Department of Juvenile Justice right now on a, on a thing that's very close to what you just asked, and that is juveniles who are currently under the supervision of the court system. And so we're verifying their whereabouts because of our rash of juvenile crimes, specifically car burglaries in Escambia County, which has been going on for months now. We recently contacted uh, uh, you know, a lady in the home of one of our uh, juvenile suspects uh, to verify that they were home at the appropriate time. The response we got from the parent was, I haven't seen him in three weeks. Uh, I don't know if he's going to school. I don't know where he is. How do you deal with that? How do you deal with that? So again, while a curfew is a, is a great idea, remember laws are for the lawless. They're not for average, everyday law-abiding citizens. Susie uh, informs us that the uh, Pensacola Police Department has a prescription drug drop box uh, in their lobby and we, we consider having one at the Escambia County Sheriff's Office. Uh, Susie will certainly look into that. I will tell you that we host uh, as the Escambia County Sheriff's Office in conjunction with the DEA, ECUA, and a couple of other are, of local agencies, uh, an annual prescription drop-off where uh, we actually have set the record for the state many times uh, in the pounds that we have gathered from medications that people uh, you know, no longer use or medications that are out of date. Uh, as you can well imagine, ECUA is involved because we don't want you to dispose of these medications. Uh, through our city water or sewer system. And so we'll certainly look into that. I know that uh, right now we have issues uh, anytime you set those boxes up, uh, you have to have an area that's continually under surveillance and manned because why? Well, we certainly wouldn't want someone breaking into the Escambia County Sheriff's Office and stealing the container uh, that had all the drugs in. So while on its surface it sounds like an excellent idea, 
it's normally one of those that re will require from us additional funding to establish it and also additional manpower resources to monitor it. So again, we'll certainly look into that, uh, but uh, you know, right now, uh, you know, we're not participating in that particular program for drug drop-offs. Uh, however, Susie, uh, we also partnership with uh, some of our local agencies and, excuse me, local businesses. It would be CVS and Walgreens. Uh, as I recall, all of their pharmacies, I uh, probably would even want to throw Walmart into that, if anyone has medications that they want to dispose of, uh, the licensed pharmacist uh, almost always will assist in that. Uh, so you can also do, uh, I'm pretty sure, drug drop-offs at all of those uh, uh, agencies that uh, also distribute you know, the pharmaceuticals. So I would check with uh, those businesses also. Uh, the question is, is what is our Explorer program? Uh, the Explorer program uh, throughout the United States is uh, an ancillary program of Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts of America. Uh, it's under the sponsorship, uh, under the same uh, leadership council, if you will, uh, and it focuses uh, exclusively on law enforcement. It's for young men and women uh, between the ages of 13 and 21. Uh, and it basically exposes them to the law enforcement community. Uh, they get an opportunity uh, to participate in everything from, you know, basic uh, crime scene investigations, fingerprinting, uh, cataloging of, of juveniles for parents, etc. Uh, and uh, they get to go on patrol with our officers, of course, all under the supervision of their counselors uh, and tightly and strictly controlled. Uh, but it's a program, again, to expose young men and women to the law enforcement career field. Uh, we have a very active program at the Sheriff's Office. Uh, we currently total about 40 uh, young men and women uh, that participate in our Explorer uh, program. Uh, if you're interested, you know, please give us a call at the Escambia County Sheriff's Office. We'll put you in touch with uh, Commander Dale Tharp's division uh, and our specific, uh, you know, overseer, if you will, uh, and counselor uh, in the Explorer program is Ms. Pat Yavara. And uh, Pat's been with us for several years. Uh, she also has uh, young children that are also in the Boy Scouts and Cub Scouts. And so, uh, you know, Pat's, uh, you know, heart uh, is in the Explorer program. Uh, and they've won several state awards under her uh, leadership uh, for their drill and ceremony team and accident investigations and those sorts of things. So uh, we uh, encourage all of our citizens, if you have young men and women who need good adult male role models and female role models, uh, to please get involved with the Explore program. Remember, you can also email your questions and ask the sheriff at escambiaso.com. We'll be back next week right here on Blab TV, Tuesday night at 8 p.m.